once around Procyon. So Procyon is the brightest star in the little constellation Canis Minor, the small dog. And I think it comes in as the eighth brightest star in the whole sky with a magnitude of just 0 0.34. So one of the bright stars of the winter sky. And you can see it marked on the map there. We have Orion to the right, the brightest star of all the skies, Sirius and its near twin down at the bottom and Procyon there making a triangle with Betelgeuse, the red giant star in Orion. So the name comes from the Greek and it means before the dog. And this is a reference to it leading the way across the sky for Sirius, the dog star. Doesn't look like it's leading it in the photograph I just showed, but it does rise first. Um, and if you're nearer the equator than I am, then it certainly makes more sense. It's one of the sun's relatively near neighbours, 11.46 light years away, determined by par parallax method, again, using the Hipparchos satellite. Um, it's a very bright star, and so Gaia doesn't like to look at it. Uh, it overwhelms the optics. So with it being so close, it does appear very bright indeed in the sky, but it's a slightly more modest star than Sirius. Class F5, so hotter than the sun at a temperature of 6,500 Kelvin. Uh, the sun is about 5,800. And that makes it white with just a hint of yellow in it. So the color index just 0 0.42. Uh, zero precisely would be white, I believe. And physically, it's at one and a half times the mass of the sun and about double the radius with an age of a relatively young 1.7 billion years, about a third as old as the sun itself. So that places it in the middle of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram on the main sequence line. You can see it there just above the sun, just next to where the tip of the Bryant, giant branch leads away from the main sequence, just below Altair and Sirius. But at the moment, it is beginning to swell. It's becoming a subgiant. It's about to head off up that giant branch. It's used almost all of its hydrogen in its core, fusing it to helium, and it will soon start to swell up, become a giant, expand by a factor of 100 in radius, and the outer layers will cool off and turn into the characteristic orange and red color. So the small inert core of helium in the center is building up and the hydrogen is fusing away around that, dumping yet more helium into it. Outside of that, there's a radiative zone carrying the heat outwards, followed by the convectional layer leading the heat all the way to the surface. Now, Procyon is in fact a binary star system, and this it was one of the early successes of astrometry, the process by which you measure the position of a star on the sky from year to year, from decade to decade, and see if there are repeating changes. This has been attempted many times to try to find out if there are unseen companions in orbit around each other rather than just a single object, and in particular, the hunt for planets and people like Peter van der Kamp looking at Barnard's star as a very famous example. But Friedrich Bessel in 1844 suggested that he had measurements indicating that this was a binary and that there was a wobble in its motion. And 20 years or so later, the orbit was then calculated and this was all known before anyone managed to see it. That took another 30 years or so before the uh, really powerful telescopes like the Lick 36-inch telescope were brought in on things and were able to actually resolve the two objects visually as separate. So we now know that Procyon B is a small white dwarf companion star going around the main A star. 
quite faint at magnitude 10.7 and only four arc seconds away. So that's why it was so difficult to spot it until we had these giant uh, telescopes. You can see the diagram of the orbit there, slightly elliptical and taking uh, just over 40 years to go round with an orbit that goes from about 9 to about 21 astronomical units. So an AU, the Earth-Sun distance, 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles. This is eight or nine of those going out to 21. And that's the scale of the outer solar system, essentially. It's uh, from uh, the orbit of around about Saturn out to somewhere beyond uh, Uranus, maybe getting on for Neptune. But uh, it's slightly tilted compared to our line of sight, so we see it as more elliptical in nature than it would otherwise be if we were absolutely face on. So the star itself, a white dwarf, 60% the mass of the sun, is very cool. Most white dwarfs we think of as being the dead nuclear cores of uh, powerful stars that have puffed off their outer layers and often with very, very high temperatures producing their light in the ultraviolet part of the spectrum at 100,000 degrees. Well, this one is cool, 7,740 Kelvin. It's still quite hot, but it's much cooler than your typical example of a white dwarf. And, well, it's a relatively low mass one at 60% the mass of the sun, but it's very, very old. It's 1.2 billion years old as a white dwarf. This progenitor star is even older than that, um, but it's been a white dwarf for over a billion years. And as it has been, it's been cooling uh, by uh, radiating its energy away, and the temperature has come all the way down to this uh, relatively modest temperature. The progenitor star would have been around about two and a half times the mass of the sun and would have carried on being a normal main sequence star, converting hydrogen to helium in the core for about 600 million years. And then it would have died, gone through the red giant phase, produced a planetary nebula, and then formed the white dwarf that we see today. And so around about 1.1 billion years ago, something like that, it would have undergone that transition. Now, eventually, the A star that we see as the brighter companion these days, but actually a lower mass object, living longer because of that lower mass, will follow the same route. And what we'll end up with is a binary white dwarf system with the A and B components still going around each other. But in the process of the A star turning into a giant and throwing off its outer layers, a lot of that material may get accreted onto the B star, and so B may gain mass. But I don't think it's going to gain enough mass in this process to cause a type 1a supernova. It would have to go from 0.6 of a solar mass all the way to 1.44, uh, so it would have to gain 0.8 of a solar mass. And it's very unlikely that it will be able to do that from the uh, existing A star, which only has two and a half solar masses in the first place, and will keep a substantial amount of that itself uh, for, in the white dwarf that it forms. And a lot of the material is going to escape in directions that do not result in it landing back on the white dwarf. Um, it would be quite bad if we had a type 1a supernova on our doorstep but i suspect we have many hundreds of millions of years to go before that's going to occur before procyon a starts to feed its uh, companion uh, by which time the motion of the stars around the galaxy will have carried the procyon system well away from us its neighbor in space is lutjens star and I've done a talk all about Lutjens star. That's just 1.2 light years away from Procyon, and you can see it marked on the map there with a little red ring around it with the A and B, oh, sorry, alpha and beta components of 
Canis, Ma uh, Canis Minor, the little dog there, Procyon at the bottom and the Beta Star at the top there. So forming a triangle with them, a right triangle, L Luton Star. And not only are they close in line of sight, but they're actually nearest neighbours in space. They say that uh, you'd be able to see Luton Star as a magnitude 4.6 star from a planet orbiting Procyon. But at the moment, we don't know of any such planets. This would be interesting to discover to see if either the A or the B white dwarf had any planets orbiting around them. But so far, attempts to locate such things have not come up with anything. So thanks very much for listening. That was a very quick once around the star Procyon.